I'm Jeremy Goldcorn. I am the Editor-in-Chief of The China Project. Welcome and thank you so much for coming. Thank you. First, the fun bit. Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Pillsbury, Deloitte, Hi2 Global, Freepoint Commodities, Dorsey & Whitney, UHY, Markham Asia, 50 Hertz Tingly Peanuts, you heard that right, and APCO Worldwide. Thank you so much for uh, making this event possible. Uh, now I have to turn to something grimmer, the current state of the world, and it's a mess. Um, this may be the most dangerous time the world has seen in decades, said Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, last month. Xi Jinping is fond of saying that we are living through changes unseen in a century. They're both right, and I find it very, very frightening. One of the enormous geopolitical changes underway is in China's relationship with the rest of the world, and at the same time, the Communist Party's relationship with the citizens of the country is changing too. Here in the US, it has become impossible to pretend that we can get along easily with China and that everything is going smoothly. But the way we talk about China here and in many other Western countries often obscures and obfuscates what is really going on. We, f we feed on hopium and copium. <laughs> many in the business community uh, and in the group of people that includes me who advocate ties with China and engage, more engagement with China, many in this community hope that if we speak nicely, if we don't mention the South China Sea aggression, human rights abuses, or other unpleasant topics, that Xi Jinping's government will be easier to deal with, or at the very least, that we'll make more money. Meanwhile, in Washington, D.C., the conventional wisdom often seems like a coping strategy for a country and a political class that has no idea how the U.S. can live with a formidable competitor like China. Many people in the blob in D.C. think that talking tough on China or saying self-righteous things about Taiwan will somehow solve America's problems. And this actually leads to profound misunderstandings of what China is and how the U.S. and other countries should deal with it. We can't just decouple from China. If you think that's possible, try going for a month without buying or consuming anything that is, uh, isn't made in China. If you take prescription medicines or antibiotics or use an iPhone or ever go to Walmart, it's impossible. We also cannot deny that the Chinese Communist Party is highly effective in many ways and that the life of the average Chinese person now is incomparably better than the average Chinese person's life in the 20th century. On the other hand, we cannot pretend that China is just a force for good on the global stage. Beijing props up dictators and authoritarians everywhere, gives moral and economic support to Vladimir Putin for his murderous war on Ukraine, and is locking up maybe more than a million Uyghurs in internment camps in an attempt to erase their culture, along with any Han Chinese person who does not want to celebrate the Chinese dream as imagined by Xi Jinping. I'll be talking about some of those things in a discussion later today with Sophie Richardson and Rehan Asat. Those topics will harsh the mellow of our business-friendly conference, but they are realities, and looking away from them isn't going to make them go away. Our work at the China Project and this conference is, in fact, about confronting the realities of what China is, the good but also the bad, not the fantasies, hopes, and dreams, and fears that inform much of the discussion about this country. To that end, we have a big range of topics we're talking about today, from law and business, artificial intelligence and semiconductors, human rights, China's relationship with the global south, and much more. We are delighted to have some of the best informed people on the planet here to share their knowledge with you. Uh, thank you again very much for coming. And with that, let me hand over to my colleague and dear friend, Kaiser Kuo, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Good morning to you all. My name is Kaiser Guo, and I am here. I've been appointed to mellow your harsh. <laughs> I, I am actually really honored. I'm profoundly honored to introduce to you our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Yasheng Huang. Yasheng holds the Epoch Foundation Professorship of Global Economics and Management. That has nothing to do, by the way, with the Epoch Times. Uh, but he, he's really much more than a mere business professor. 
He is a bona fide intellectual in the best possible sense of the world, of the word, he in the world. He actually I, I think is somebody who, who thinks more profoundly, asks deeper questions, more probing, daring questions, the big questions, uh, which I think is altogether too rare these days in academia. Uh, he's someone with, I think, a, a real, a, a lot of moral courage as well. And his latest book, which is called The Rise and Fall of the East, How Exams, Autocracy, Stability, and Technology Brought China's Success, and why they might lead to its decline, which you can pick up here, and he will be signing throughout the day, uh, is, is a book that I had the great pleasure of interviewing him about at, at considerable length on my program, The Seneca Podcast. Uh, it's certainly one of the most ambitious and most thought-provoking books that I have read in many, many years. So I am very, very grateful to Yasheng that he could be our keynote speaker today. I ask you all to welcome him, Yasheng Huang, the stage is yours. <laughs> Clap loudly enough so he can hear you behind that door. Yeah, thank you, uh, Kaiser, and uh, for that introduction. I feel really nervous because I told uh, Kaiser um, one of the key things in education is to manage expectations. And in my classes on my first day, I usually would uh, deliberately denigrate myself uh, as a bad teacher and, and then some students would leave. So then I, sh I know for sure those who remain are truly interested uh, in the class and, and therefore I get a good rating uh, at the end. Uh, the other reason I feel nervous is that um, uh, for those uh, who attended last night's dinner, before the dinner there was a podcast, and one of the main themes in that podcast is against lecture, giving a lecture. So here I am, I'm giving a lecture, and so I sort of have to think about the cautionary uh, note from yesterday's uh, lecture. And I'm really, really uh, greatly uh, appreciative of the invitation, as well as this topic, uh, how to leverage China's past to forge uh, its future. And I think the answer to that question is very clear and in the following way, yes, a must and a should. A must because China doesn't have a choice not to do that. Every nation is shaped by its history. And this is just a factual statement. It's like saying we, are sh uh, we were shaped, uh, we are what we are because of our upbringing, because of our early experiences in life. This is just a factually valid statement, regardless of our judgments, views, and perspectives of that history. So that aside, you, if you're critical, if you, uh, if you praise that history, that's irrelevant. That's just, that's just because it's part of you, you have to build the future on that basis. So I believe that uh, should be our starting point of any debates and discussions related to China's future. History provides the anchoring baseline that we either organize our future around or we propose a course of actions that incrementally departs from that baseline. This may sound simple and straightforward until you, um, you contrast that view with the views that we often hear, right? We did hear in the 1950s that China should adopt central planning because this was what the Soviets did, right? Or the view proposed by many people in the West today that China should adopt a multi-party democracy because Europe and America have done it. In those narratives, we're pivoting our baseline to a 
we're, we're pivoting our advocacy for a future for China to a different baseline. The baseline of the Soviet Union or the baseline of Western democracy. So we learn from history that a radical transition of political and economic systems can fail, and especially if that transition aims to transcend history, that transition can fail and can fail catastrophically. Russia is exhibit one of that statement. In the 1990s, as everybody here knows very well, the country attempted a quantum leap toward a market economy and a democracy, and the country incurred a massive cost in terms of the economy and in terms of human welfare. To add an insult to injury, they didn't succeed. Today's Russia is neither a functioning market economy nor a functional democracy. All this massive cost, and all you get is a lesser and probably a shorter version of the Peter the Great. In retrospect, I wonder, although that can be debated, I wonder if Russia would have been better had it tried harder to have an improved version of autocracy and a more market-oriented planned economy. When we contemplate China's future, we cannot ignore its history. We want China to change and to modernize, but I believe that the best way is for the country to evolve rather than to revolutionize. This way of thinking has foreign policy implications. I live in Washington, D.C. these days. The consensus view that I hear in Washington, D.C. is that economic engagement, educational engagement, commercial engagement with China has failed because that engagement has not delivered a Chinese democracy. Uh, I believe that view of engagement is fundamentally flawed. Engagement has created opportunities for the Chinese people to acquire knowledge about what it means to improve the living standard. It has enabled them to improve the living standard, but more importantly, I think going forward, it has created knowledge of what improved living standard means. And it has also exposed Chinese people to values and ideas that were previously unavailable to the country. This is a massive accomplishment of engagement, and we shouldn't belittle that accomplishment, and we should build on it. Engagement, therefore, moves China to a new baseline without suddenly disrupting, uh, disrupting and destroying its old existing baseline of politics. Engagement, I would argue, is a safer way for China to forge its future by tying itself to its political tradition and culture and past that has produced a stability, but also by moving to a new economic baseline that has produced economic growth and development. In a complex system, moving components of a system one by one is more stable than moving everything simultaneously. And I think we should always remember that lesson. There are also valuable intellectual and political assets China should leverage to forge its future. So just now I talk about why it must, now I talk about why it should. In my uh, newly published book, I, was, I singled out exam system uh, for a detailed uh, examination and argued that the civil service exam system that was established in the sixth century anchored Chinese uh, politics and Chinese uh, economy. In my book, I was both critical 
but I, of that system, but I was also positive about the civil service exam system in Chinese uh, imperial time. In Chinese, it's known as uh, Keju. Uh, Keju definitely decimated creativity and uh, uh, intellectual curiosity, right? So we show in our work that once Keju was introduced, Chinese technology, Chinese inventiveness began to stagnate. So that's a shortcoming, okay, minor one, but it's a shortcoming to be sure. But let me be very clear, could you also led to literacy, numeracy, and cultivated work ethics, right? To those of you who, uh, who, who have taken sociology classes at college, you will know the name Max Weber. Max Weber was negative about Confucian culture and argued that Confucian culture was incompatible with economic growth. That was kind of wrong, um, and Confucian culture has actually uh, been very, very successful in creating economic growth. The reason is that Keju system cultivated work ethics right, and literacy. Those characteristics, those features, those factors are critically important in modern economic development, in modern economic takeoff. It is no accident when the economic policies become reasonable, when the economic conditions are there, it is East Asia that first took off economically. First, it was Japan, then South Korea, and Taiwan, and then since 1978, China. Yes, Keju is heavy on rote memorization, repetitions, but my proposal is not to abolish Gaokao, which is a college exam system modeled on Keju. My proposal is to create other, and multi uh, other competing multiple channels of information and knowledge that cultivate out-of-box thinking, risk-taking, and questioning of the authority. Why throw away an institution that is time-tested, that is widely accepted as legitimate, and that incubates value, valuable skills and human capital? Don't throw it away. Just add to that institution other channels of information and knowledge transmission. That argument leads to a perspective I want to end my uh, speech on. In order to think about this question, which part of the Chinese legacy we should keep and which part we should give up, that requires us to depart from our historical baseline in a particular area. And that is the area of free speech and freedom to debate and discuss. We need some freedom to discuss and debate the pros and cons of our history. No country is not shaped by its history, but no country should be enslaved to its own history. We no longer execute people on the guillotines on public squares or push women into the water to see if they're witches. No girl born in today's China would have her feet bound, right? That's just the reality. Let's just be very, very clear uh, uh, about that. We keep some history. We also give up on other parts of our history. We keep, but we also move on from our history. But to know which history to keep and which history to, to, uh, to uh, give up on requires debate, requires thinking, requires exchanges of views and perspectives. And this is what uh, Amartya Sen calls discussion democracy. He uses the discussion democracy to describe India before the British rule in his argument that India had a version of democracy before uh, the British rule that imposed the uh, British version of democracy on the country. 
In other words, we need some basic level of democracy to engage in that exercise. And let me say that uh, if China was in that situation, I would argue before uh, 2012, and the problem now is that China is moving away from that situation, and that has made this particular exercise more difficult than it should be. Thank you very much, Kaiser. Thank you.